Hello Summoners and welcome back to another episode of Pro Guide's Best Champions to me, now on patch 11.12. The champions we pick for these series are strong picks with high performance, but have relatively low ban rates, and they're unlikely to be nerfed anytime soon. They're reliable picks for climbing, and they're worth investing your time in. We also have a series that covers the most broken, contested picks in each role, so be sure that you're subbed to the channel so you never miss out when we post these as well. Starting things off in the top lane, we have Jax. Usually the champs that people pay attention to from patch to patch are the ones that are actually in the notes, but an often overlooked byproduct of balancing is how nerfing champions at the top lane can bring completely untouched champions up a notch or two. And now Jax is one of those champions ripping in those rewards. With the buff to Divine Sunderer and nerfs to a lot of his competition in the past few patches, there aren't many solid answers the enemy team can pick when you lock him in. Just be sure that you're banning Malphite out when you have to blind pick. For how hard he scales, Jax's laning phase is pretty solid. Against any auto attack reliant champion, you can easily win trades with your E, but if you end up in a lane where you can't just fight early, you can just always sit on your Q's cooldown and leap back to safety. With his scaling being late game insurance, you always want to be on the side of caution in the early game. It can be tempting to constantly leap in and duke it out with your opponent, but greedily trading for no real gain and dying to jungle ganks is probably the number one reason Jax players end up not carrying. Our second top laner is quite literally a nightmare to deal with, and you've guessed it, it's Nocturne. With how OP he is as a flex pick in pro play and how good his stats are in solo queue, I have no idea why this champion isn't being hit with some serious nerfs. And it's not just right that's not paying him much attention. His win rate and ban rate are low enough for us to consider him a good champion to main after all. So as long as people keep ignoring him, you may as well pick up some free LP. Nock is just too solid of a laner for quite a few reasons. For one, he has what I call infinite priority. With the AoE damage from his passive and Q, Nocturne pushes harder and faster than any other champion. Usually the answer to a champion that you can't outpush is to contest them by fighting the champion himself. But with Nocturne, your opponent won't be able to do that. That's because Nocturne is also basically undulable, if that's a word. You, you can't duel him. The combination of the bonus AD from being on his trail along with him having a spell shield and a fear makes forcing on Nocturne suicide. His 1v1 strength is so high that he can even win all in fights against Darius, something that not many other champions can boast. The one champion that was able to fight Nocturne, at least in the right conditions, was Wukong, but with him seeing many nerfs on this patch, one of the only decent answers to Nocturne has to try that much harder to win the lane. With the old style of full damage, Assassin Nocturne, you can easily one-shot any squishy that you found out on their own. While this build definitely lacks the insta-kill potential, the added beefiness can make him so much easier to be a diver. This is the advantage over the old Nocturne where he wouldn't even be able to get the burst needed to bring on the ADC because he would be too squishy. And while you may not one-shot the ADCs you find farming in the lane on their own, you'll still be able to bring them down with ease. It'll just be a more painful, drawn-out process for them. All the champions on the list are great champions to main because they are so strong to hard carry games, but not so overbearing that they're too popular. Even though we know that they're OP, it looks like Riot doesn't, and they won't be getting changed anytime soon. But just locking in these champions with no clue on how to actually play them won't be enough to start raking in the LP. Our videos are a great starting point, but if you're really serious about climbing, you should pick up a pro guide sub. With the sub, you'll get access to all of our online courses, unlimited chats with our coaches, and if you book a session, you'll even get a discounted rate as well. With these resources, you'll save a ton of time by actually improving before you start grinding your face against the wall that is solo queue. And right now, we're running a great deal. Just use the discount code RANKUP2021 for 20% off your next sub. So, what are you waiting for? Head over to ProGuides.com for yours today. Now, let's get back to the video. Our final top lane champion to main on this patch is Urgot. His early game dueling is definitely weaker than most of the other champions in the top lane, so you'll want to avoid committing to all-in fights. But that doesn't mean you're totally unable to trade. You just have to be careful with the fights that you take. This is especially true when you're fighting around your passive shotgun knees cooldowns. When you don't want to fight, the soul from your Q and your dash from your E makes it pretty easy to escape from danger. Once you reach level 9 and max out your W, it becomes a toggle and fights get a little bit easier, but you aren't at your peak like me in high school. You still need level 13, where your passive reaches its minimum cooldown of 2.5 seconds. Once you have that spike and two items, you're able to shred pretty much any champion that gets in range of your E. One tip for committing to all ends is always to use your ultimate right after you land your E on an opponent. While a half of a second may not seem like much time, in terms of league abilities, the relatively telegraphed cast for your Urgot's ultimate makes it pretty easy to dodge, especially if your target has flash up. But when they're stunned for a full second at point blank range, they're forced to take the projectile. The subsequent slow makes it easy to chase and finish them off, even if they try to flash away. 
As a final note, you probably want to avoid 5v5s most of the time if the enemy team is mostly ranged champions that want to play the kite. He does an insane amount of damage to any target that he can get on, and he's as tanky as any other juggernaut, but he's extremely susceptible to being kited. He's much better in 1v1s or smaller scale skirmishes. In the event that you do have to take a team fight, just stick to front to back fighting. His passive destroys tanks, especially once you have Black Cleaver, so you'll literally kill most frontliners before you can realistically reach the enemy backlines for most fights. Taking a look now at the jungle, our first pick is Zac. In a meta favoring mostly early game ganking, Zac is arguably the best tank in the role. Other tanks like Sejuani, Scion, and Amumu may be super strong team fighters, but when their ultimates are down, they're basically useless. That means there's a lot of downtime between their usefulness. But with Zac, you're able to repeat gank over and over, since his main ability for engaging onto his opponent is his E. Early game, the reach is pretty lackluster, but once you get it maxed out, you're able to gank from over any wall in the game. With unlimited ganking routes on all three lanes, you're able to provide constant pressure for your laners. The weaker early game does mean that you'll have to be careful on how you path, since running into an Elise or Lee Sin can spell trouble for you in the early game, especially if they find you when your E is on cooldown. They'll also be able to gank a lot more than you, so try to track them down for your laners to prevent them from snowballing too hard too early. If you can make it past the early game, not only will you be able to pretty much match or even surpass their gank pressure, but your team fighting presence is much stronger. While the early game champions that previously bullied you now get blown up if they try to 5v5, you have the ability to leap straight into the enemy backline or disrupt or even kill them if they aren't peeled. Our second jungler is Rek'Sai. You can think of Rek'Sai as almost a budget version of Shaco. She has a similar ability of being able to gank over walls, and while she may not be quite as OP as the Demon Jester, she's also much more slept on, being basically never picked or banned. Just like any other champ comparison, there are pros and cons. Sure, a Fed Shaco can pretty much one-shot quicker without even being seen thanks to his stealth, but Rek'Sai has some strengths that he doesn't. The main thing is her dueling strength against other bruisers. Shaco may be able to one-shot ADCs, but he's usually not going to win against any champion that he can't totally 100-0. Rek'Sai is able to fight champions like Lee Sin, Shin Zhao, and Kane much easier, making scuttle fights much more winnable in the early game. Rek'Sai also has an instant knockup, making it easy to gank for allies that can chain CC with you for guaranteed kills. Aside from the early ganks, once you get onto the later stages of the game, you'll want to constantly look for picks or skirmishes. If it comes down to 5v5 fighting, just look for a flank. Rek'Sai's E is incredibly slow and telegraphed, and you'll pretty much always be disengaged by frontliners if you try to reach their backline. So play around vision and look to tunnel in from the side, using Flash and Prowler's Claw to easily reach the vulnerable backline carries. Our last jungler is Master Yi. While he may be the mascot of ELO Hell and the jungle equivalent of Yasuo, Yi is actually a pretty strong champion even in high ELO and played well. Yes, I said played well. You may think Yi is a mindless champion for players with no mechanics, but there are little tricks here and there that set apart a good Yi player from the average ones that just smack things until they die. The most important thing with Yi in that regard is the time to use the spells correctly. Players that face roll their keyboard to maximize damage usually use spells that come off cooldown right away, but with Yi, you don't want to do that. Instead of just using Q as soon as it's ready, you should try to time it to dodge incoming CC or big sources of damage, or to follow a dash or a blink. Late game, you actually get more DPS out of autoing, so it's especially important to use this Q for utility over mindlessly smashing it. Yi's W is also worth talking about here. Good Yi players know that if you W and instantly right click an opponent, it serves as a free auto reset. Aside from using it to increase the damage that you do, you should know when and how to use it for damage mitigation. For example, against somebody like Vagar or Riven, you may want to use it just as they use their ultimate, and immediately cancel it out after you reduce the damage from that. But in a 3v3 skirmish, you may want to hold the channel and just absorb all the incoming damage. The huge damage reduction and heal makes you basically invincible, and most enemies will overestimate the ability to kill you as your teammates bring them down instead. As a final note, there are some changes that you can make to our build. If the enemy team has a fed AP threat, or just multiple AP threats in general, definitely consider going Wood's End before Blade of the Ruined King. If the enemy comp has a lot of beefy champions with armor, you should get a Lord Dominic's regards. Everybody thinks Blade of the Ruined King is instant counter to tanks, but if they have armor, you need the pen to back up the blade that can actually cut them down. Now for some mid laners, we'll be starting off with Kiana. Kiana's overall win rate is pretty average, just barely being above 50%. But when you narrow the search to higher elos, her win rate spikes pretty dramatically. This means that she has a pretty sharp mastery curve, and playing her at an above average or even a good level still leaves her pretty mediocre in terms of her impact on the game. But if you play her perfectly, you can hard carry before the enemy team even has a chance to get a foot in the game. 
Her quick bursty trades leave opponents with little time to trade back any damage of their own, which usually results in most opponents just conceding the lane and letting you have your way. This is exactly what you want, since Kiana is an amazing roaming champion. Use any roam timer you get to work with your jungler, helping them secure scuttles or even invade to kill the enemy jungler. Roams to bot lane are also very effective, but you'll also have to wait for level 6 where you can get a much more higher kill potential, especially during coordinated dives where your ultimate basically guarantees a clean double kill. Aside from her roams, Kiana having early CC also means that you can work with your jungler to easily net kills on your own lane. As long as you know how to properly combo E and Q, you literally can't miss the route, and you'll especially be able to burst down your opponent. Once you get into teamfights, Kiana may have lightning fast combos, but you'll want to play it somewhat slow until you have the right opportunity. Then, the second that you see the enemy team just a little bit too close to a wall, immediately go for a flashy ult combo. With the damage her full combo does, this is usually enough to wipe out any squishies that get caught in the ultimate, and whoever is left, your team can clean up. If you'd rather play an easier, more team-centric champion, maybe Galio is more your speed. The build that we have here is more bruiserish, focusing on engaging fights and playing as our frontliner, but you can also build to do damage. In that case, you can pick up a Magi's and Rabadons over Banshees and Demonic Embrace. And if you're going full AP, you might as well just swap out the Lucidity Boots for Sorcerer Shoes for maximum one-shot potential. Regardless of your endgame build, the early game is going to play the same. Most champions that are designed to be a lane bully have plenty of ways to win early. Take Rennington and Garen for example. They can snowball like crazy, but you know, when they don't, they're pretty much useless. With Galio, you can definitely bully all the other melee champions in mid and maintain priority to play with your jungler, but your team play style also makes you an amazing scaling pick, useful at all stages of the game whether you're fed or not. Obviously, you want to call your jungler when you see the opportunity to make free kills happen, but if your jungler just hates free gold, then no biggie. You can focus on farming up and playing for big team fights. While this build does run Predator for the extra cash potential, Galio's engage is still pretty telegraphed. This means that just running at the enemy team isn't easy when dealing with champions that can easily stop you, such as Thresh. You'll get the best results when you play a little bit more reactively, either using your ultimate to follow a different engaging champ into a fight, or swapping to a defensive playstyle and then using your ultimate to peel off divers off your own team. While you may not be the most flashy champion, and playing for your team can be frustrating when you end up just with a bunch of feeders, he definitely gets consistent results. The lack of the 1v9 definitely makes him a pick that edgy Yasuo and Zed players will steer away from, but if you like playing with and around your team, he's definitely somebody that you should pick up. Which category do you fall into? And that brings us to today's question of the day. Do you think you're too good for your elo to play team-centric champions like Galio, or you're just willing to trust your teammates enough to lock one in? We're interested to see where the viewers fall, so let us know down in the comments below. Our last mid to main on 11.12 is Ari. Sometimes Ari's identity of being both a mage and assassin can be a weakness. As we often say, being a jack of all trades in League is usually worse than just being a master of one. But at the moment, with mages being considered overall pretty weak, she's one of the only ones in the champion class that can be reliably picked, and she's doing super well. The mage side of her kit gives her a solid wave clear and at least decent poking power in lane. While she may not have the instant burst that most assassins have, she still has her mobility and if you can land a charm, it's pretty much gonna ensure a kill, even in the early game. And if you end up getting fed, you can kill squishy targets with just your ults and your W. I've died by many Aries that just miss everything except for their ultimate and W, but you know, they got fed enough to get there. Just be sure, when you do that, make sure you type outplayed in the all chat to tilt everybody off of existence. In teamfights, you don't have the consistent DPS that standard control mages have to melt through huge health bars, but the true damage on Q helps get through squishier opponents that try to stack MR. You can also use her ultimate's mobility in both offensive and defensive ways. You can bypass the frontline with it to reach the enemy backline, or if threads are getting a little bit too close to you, you can use it to kite away from danger. As a final tip for Ari, the biggest mistake I see that Ari players do is trying too hard to hit their charm right at the start of the fight. Take your time until you have a for sure shot. One good thing to aim for is to use your first and second ultimates trying to force the target's flash, and then go for a charm once that's down. Moving down to the bot lane, we'll be starting off with Kogma, featuring a new build that's been going around. This build puts off your mythic items till the very end of the game, building into the damage first, and then becoming super tanky later. If you're dealing with super high threat dive early, you can always get the Randuins before Ginsu's. This helps make up for Cog's vulnerability instead of just relying on a support to do so. But you can also still build him full damage for maximum carry potential if you trust your team. And if you want to do that, replace Randuin's and Frostfire with Kraken Slayer and Blade of the Rune King. Early game Cogma's damage isn't actually that bad. 
it's just that his trading is limited to having his W available. So with that in mind, don't make the all too common mistake of just randomly using your W to get in a single auto or two on the enemy backliner with volatile bot lanes. If you're just against a weaker bot lane that just can't aggro, you won't be overly punished. But against a lane like Thresh and Lucian, having your W ready is the only way that you can turn the fight in your favor. Once you get out the laning phase, keep up the farm game. Kog'Maw's only appeal over the other carries is his insane DPS. If you fall behind and can't kill opponents before they can reach you, there's no real point in playing him. I gotta say, Kog'Maw is pretty fun to play. He's usually overshadowed by other carries that have more mobility or utility, but this build makes him quite viable, even against assassins. I'm glad that he's found his place back in the meta, but some people think that Kog's very identity, just a champion that spews DPS, is quite unhealthy. I see where they're coming from, but I just love the little void caterpillar. What about you? Do you think a pure damage range hybrid carry is unhealthy and hard to balance? Sound out down in the comments down below so we can see your takes. Our second ADC is Draven, who was already doing pretty decent and now has received a nice little buff to his Q damage in this patch. Draven definitely falls into our category of champions that is really mild when you're bad but super oppressive when you actually know how to play him. Good Draven mains can already win most lane matchups, and while this buff will help win lane a little bit harder, it really starts to show once you're already fed. Draven already easily rolls over the other squishy carries, able to basically do assassin's level of burst when he's holding two axes. But he struggles a little bit when it comes to fight against the tanker champions that he can't immediately kill. The added damage will specifically help you push your lead against the tougher to kill targets. In the laning phase, it's going to be pretty self-explanatory that you want to cash in your passive before you lose your stacks, especially if you reach the triple digits, but I'm going to say it anyways. Be extra mindful where the junglers are when you play Draven. Dying to a gank and losing over 100 stacks is a tilting experience, and is the reason that most Draven mains seem to be mentally unstable. When you get your stacks high, call your jungler and even your mid for a dive and communicate that they should really try to give you one of those kills if possible. Out of the lane, group up and team fight front to back. It may be tempting to go for ego plays like 1v1ing random enemy opponents, but with Draven's insane damage when ahead, you're basically guaranteed to win if you just stick to 5v5 team fighting. Our last pick for the bot lane isn't a standard marksman, instead we have Heimerdinger. This may be a little bit overhyped, but there are basically no counters to bot lane Heimi. Most of your laning will be shoving in waves with their turrets and then landing some hard hitting poke on your enemies as they try to huddle under their turret. The obvious answer to a push and poke style of a laner is to force all lanes, but against Heimerdinger that generally doesn't go that well. That's because the second the enemy bot lane tries to go in, you just throw your grenade out and then stun them. Not only will you be able to walk away while they're CC'd, but they'll also be melted away by your turret's lasers. Just be sure that you're not throwing out your E aggressively on your enemies while you're harassing them under their turret. The other thing to think about with Heimerdinger is your ultimate usage. Most Heimerdinger players default to using ulted turret in fights, and that definitely is generally the right thing to do, but don't do it in every single fight. It's great when the enemy team is diving onto your backline, but if they're playing from range, you should stick to using ult to grenade for a huge teamfight disruption. Ult rockets should be pretty much always avoided unless you're specifically trying to burst down an enemy that's already CC'd. Following up on our carries, we'll be talking about our supports, the first of those being Janna. While everybody thinks enchanters are easy, no effort way to climb, if you're playing Janna right, you should be having an impact both in and out of lane. Early on, you want to use her W to harass the other laners, but be careful about spamming it too much. You'll go oom if you use it on cooldown, so instead, trade around your mana flow band. Once you have it fully stacked, you won't have to worry about going oom so much. If you want even more poke in the laning phase, you can even swap airy for common, and gathering storm to scorch. Aside from bullying and lane, you can pretty much proactively roam as Janna. The movement speed from her passive and W allow you to zip around the map really fast. While you may not have the same type of lockdown that a roaming Alistar or Blitzcrank has, you can still easily net kills on overextended opponents. In teamfights, like any other enchanter, you'll be playing to buff up and keep your carries safe, but you need a position a bit differently than champions like Lulu and Soraka. Since your Q and ultimate can disengage incoming divers, you need to make sure that you're in between your carries and the enemy champions and not sitting behind your team. Sona is another enchanter that we think that you should be picking up this patch. Unlike Janna, she has pretty much no early proactivity or impact, but in exchange, you'll be playing a champion with insane scaling. While she isn't the most exciting champion to play, there's no denying how much she buffs up the entire team as you spam through your cooldowns. However, don't just face roll your keyboard in fights. It's really important to pay attention to which power cord you use. Q's power cord is usually the best option in early 2v2 fights, where just going more damage usually means winning trades. But in later fights, where Sona's own damage is basically irrelevant, you want to stick to using your W's power cord. 
A well-timed one can massively reduce the burst from incoming assassins and divers on your carries and make a pretty big difference in the outcome of fights. When you don't need the defensive ability of W's power cord, you can get better results out of the E's power cord. Again, Sona's damage falls off pretty hard, so the slow enables your team to bring down the target instead. Sona's ultimate makes her one of the few enchanters that can actually provide hard CC to a wombo combo. It obviously doesn't cover the same massive area that Seraphine does, but it comes out much quicker. So you'll have a much easier time using it reactively when you need one of those big split second plays. Just bear in mind how squishy Sona is. Even compared to the other enchanters, she's incredibly squishy and you can even die to all ins against other enchanters if you get caught off by any type of CC. You'll have to really juggle between getting into auto range or power cord and then backing right out to avoid giving over a free kill. Finishing off our list, we have Rakan. While he mostly builds like an enchanter, his playstyle is anything but that. You'll use Rakan's flashy kit to go for huge engages and then set up the rest of your team to wipe out your opponents. In lane, Rakan's trading can be tricky to do right, but once you know how to combo with him, he pretty much covers all of your bases. He has the same when you lane with his Q. His W gives you a free way to engage repeal, and his E can be used to protect your ADC, reposition to land your W, or to get back out after you've already gone in. He'll use his wide range of skills to play every matchup differently. For example, he may go super aggro against enchanters, but against somebody like Leona, diving right into them can easily result in you being locked up and killed, unable to even use your E to dash out before you die. In lanes like that, you want to play a little bit more reactively. Wait for Leona to go in on your ADC, and then E to shield your ally and W to prevent Leona's ADC from following up on her CC. Once you have your ultimate, your engage and disengage strengths gets even better, but you still won't be the strongest 2v2 support to go for kills. Instead, your main goal is to team fight. You'll want to look to 5v5 anytime that your ultimate is up, popping Shirelius and your ultimate for a huge boost of speed. Unlike other engaged supports that usually aim to lock up every single priority target, with Rakan, you want to run around, tagging as many enemies as you can with your ultimate. After you land your W and your ultimate wears off, you can use your E to dash back out to safety, or to shield an ally that may be in danger, or wait for your W's cooldown if you have to re-enter the fight. <sighs> and that is going to be our top 3 champions to main in patch 11.12. I hope you guys enjoyed the video, and if you did, be sure to sub so you never miss out on our meta guides, and you're always in the loop on what the best picks are. Remember, let us know if you're the type of player to pick for your team or not down in the comments below. And one last thing, don't forget to check out our Discord in the description box below where you can discuss League further or just hang around and be a part of the community. I can't wait to see you guys back in the next video, but until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day. Peace.